is that there's a feeling throughout this, well, throughout the clubhouse, but also throughout the organization that we have something to prove. We disappointed not only ourselves last year, we disappointed White Sox fans, and we surprised the rest of baseball in terms of how far below our capabilities we felt like we played. Executive Vice President and General Manager of the Chicago White Sox. We are your home for White Sox baseball. Rick Hahn is with us. Rick, good morning. Three weeks from today, we start the 2023 season. How are things shaping up from your end? Uh, good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. And, and only three weeks is, is music to our ears. We are right. eager to get going. Uh, it has been a out camp so far. Obviously, we're only halfway through, and we need some uh, blessings from the baseball gods to stay healthy here over the next 21 days. But uh, so far, so good. It's been, uh, it's been exciting down here. Rick, I, I want to ask about uh, comments made by o Jose Abreu regarding togetherness. That's a big word, it's a mouthful. When, a, when Jose Abreu says the Sox had a problem with togetherness last season, what do you think he means by that? You know, Jonathan, I, I think that's probably a better question for Jose if you get a chance to speak to him. I think from our standpoint, our focus is on building something special here with Pedro and the new staff. And I got to say, the whether you call it togetherness or communication or everyone pulling from the same direction, whether it's players in the clubhouse, uh, our staff, our player development people or scouts, uh, for the last several weeks and frankly, last several months, ever since Pedro's come on board, uh, we've had a fantastic dynamic going on in that clubhouse. And uh, we're just eager to get going on this season and see it hopefully translate into much, much better results on the field. Rick, as I looked at your off season, and now that the Clevenger issue is behind you, I still am a, this is from my seat, a little bit of trepidation that there's not enough depth if you have to deal with any type of starting pitching injuries, which Carlos Rodon, the Yankees just spent $165 million and he's going to start the season on the injured list. So do you is that something that gives you pause or you feel like you have enough depth there that you could handle a 15-day DL stint? 15 uh, days, sure. But I will tell you right now, there's not a single GM in baseball who's going to sit here three weeks before the season and tell you they're comfortable with their pitching depth. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a volatile and difficult to project uh, player class where there's a great deal of risk involved. So I think all of us try to be as, as diligent as possible in trying to accumulate as much depth as possible. Uh, as we sit here today, knock on wood, the five that we plan to break with are, are in good stead. Uh, we have Davis Martin behind them, uh, who's having a nice spring as well. Uh, and we're hopeful about some of our young guys taking that step forward this year that we saw Davis take last year, whether it's a, a Sean Burke or a now healthy Jonathan Seaver or a guy like Jesse Schlotten, who Schulten, who in camp this so far has been mild, somewhat impressive. So uh, we're going to stay on that group and hopefully add over the course of the season but uh, as we sit here today we're in a we're in a decent spot rick every year you're trying to improve this roster tinker with this roster to get it to a championship level why do you believe that this roster could be better than last year's Sox team well look you, you rewind to 12 months ago and not only you know inside the organization but perhaps more importantly when you looked at the objective projections for where this team was headed, uh, much less the evaluations of, of those who come through camp and, and prognosticate over the course of the season, we were expected to potentially run away with this division. Many of us were, many clubs or many experts were talking about us as World Series contenders. And we feel like we have a group that dramatically underachieved. Obviously, just about everything that could have gone wrong last year did go wrong. Uh, in some ways, it's, we're, it's remarkable that we actually wound up 500, given all the adversity we faced. But that core group of talent is still there. We feel we have a more balanced team this year by having a guy like Andrew Benintendi in the lineup. If Oscar Colas seizes the right field job, that helps balance things out as well and improves the outfield defense. Uh, we've strengthened ourselves up the middle by having essentially two shortstops at shortstop and second and T.A. and Andrus. And given what we all saw to Elvis over the last you know couple of months when he was in a White Sox uniform and how he looks thus far this spring, that gives us a lot of hope for not only 
how we're going to be improved defensively, but also how we're going to be a, a smarter and more professional team from top to bottom in that lineup. So your manager, Pedro Grafal, said, look, I looked across the field and I did not see the energy from that team. You now had the opportunity, as you should, go out and do a search. And who does Rick want to manage the team he's the GM of? And you got to pick your guy. And I'm hearing, I wasn't at camp. I'm hearing, wow, there's really good energy and the prep looks good and just a different vibe. Do you see a different vibe with this man? I'm not asking you to say anything about the former manager. This camp, are you pleased with the energy and vibe you're seeing? Could not be happier, Cap. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know what it looks like from 2,000 miles away, but I know everyone who comes through here is stunned, let's say, or, or uh, overly impressed with our attention to detail, the communication, the diligence and focus on fundamentals. And the professionalism, which each day is run with, you know, frankly, Pedro and his staff are rolling into the complex at around 4.30, 5, 5.30 a.m. every day uh, to get ready for, for each day. And they're there past the end of the game, which makes me a little concerned about maintaining that level of energy and focus over the course of a seven month season going through October. But the, the diligence, focus and energy we're seeing from the staff has translated into the drills, has translated into uh, the clubhouse, and has made for, a so far, a very successful camp. We, we, we could not be happier with where we sit right now. White Sox General Manager Rick Hahn with Cap and Jay Hood on Chicago's Home for Sports and the home of the White Sox, ESPN 1000. Rick, I've heard you and Pedro talk about playing with an edge. I remember when Pedro was hired and how that was important to be able to play with an edge. I think you're describing some of that as far as being diligent on the field. Could you define what that entails for this team? When you say edge, what do you want to see? Well, I think there's two ways to, to look at it, Jonathan. One, I think what part of what Pedro was refer, referencing was making sure we use every advantage at our disposal to help us win that night, whether that's a matchup, whether it's positioning, whether it's a pitch selection or an approach from our hitters versus that night starter, using every competitive advantage that is presented over the course of the evening to our advantage when possible. I think another thing you're referencing and something I've talked about a little bit when I've used the word edge is that there's a feeling throughout this, well, throughout the clubhouse, but also throughout the organization that we have something to prove. We disappointed not only ourselves last year, we disappointed White Sox fans, and we surprised the rest of baseball in terms of how far below our capabilities we felt like we played. So whether you single out an individual player in that clubhouse, uh, who feels like they have something to prove, or you talk to a coach or this or as, you know a front office executive, we all feel a little bit of an edge in terms of something to prove to ourselves and to the rest of baseball this year, which I, again, I think that sort of chip or edge or whatever you want to call it uh, is going to serve us well. So I sit on my couch, I watch Every White Sox game. I watch every Cubs game. I've got multiple screens going, and I'm locked in. It's my favorite sport. I love baseball. You've got a two-to-one lead. We're going to the ninth. Buckle your seatbelt. But you have a closer who's dealing with a health crisis right now. Do you feel like I might have to designate one guy? You're going to be the closer till Liam is back with us. I may have to go make a trade and get somebody that I can plug into that role or... I can handle this internally. Both what you reference is, is, are, are possible, whether we designate somebody or ultimately make the decision to go outside the organization to add at some point, obviously closer to the deadline. However, as we sit here today and talking things through with Pedro and looking at you know, the options we have, whether it's Graveman or Kelly or Lopez or potentially Bummer from the left side, he feels, and I agree strongly, that we have – the talent in the current back end makeup of the, of the bullpen for him to mix and match for him to, as he describes it, play the leverage game and decide, you know, as you well know, watching all that baseball, a lot of nights, the game is decided in the seventh or eighth inning. Yep. You know, that's when the, the middle of the order is coming up to protect that one run lead or the starter runs out of gas and you've got to bring in a guy who you need a strikeout or a double play with an inherited runner. So going into the year, Pedro's going to, 
take that approach. He's going to use the best guy for the given situation, regardless of uh, what inning it is. If for whatever reason, prior to Liam returning, that way is not working or someone sort of seizes that ninth inning with their performance, we'll adjust on the fly. But the, the talent is there to, uh, you know, knock on wood, be able to survive uh, Liam's absence. Rick, of course, you have to take care of your own house with the White Sox, but I'm also wondering your thoughts about overall the American League Central and how competitive you believe your roster is to the Guardians, Twins, and others in the division. Look, the Guardians are the champs. And just like we were the hunted last year coming off of our division, you know, they're the hunted. And we have something to prove uh, that we're able to measure up against them. Not necessarily only in terms of wins and losses, which obviously is the most important thing, probably the three most important things to us, but in terms of the intensity and the competitiveness that we show against them on a nightly basis. There were just nights where they brought it more than we did. And as Pedro referenced, even though he's referring to Royals, White Sox games, there were nights where you could look across the dugout and know that we weren't necessarily bringing it at the full level that we needed to with that level of focus and intensity to win that night. The Guardians did that for six months, and that's why they wore the crown. So we need to match them from that standpoint, and we need to prove we're able to uh, beat them on the field at the end of end of nine. Uh, obviously, the, the Twins are going to, you know, despite a disappointing season from them last year, they are extraordinarily talented. Uh, and we'll be right there as well. And we all see how the Royals play us all the time. And, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a highly competitive division, which frankly, I think makes for a fun summer and one we're very much looking forward to. I want to use that word. You just said fun in 2019, 2020, your team was fun. Like in 19, Hey, hey, they're coming, man. They're coming. Not quite there yet. They're coming 2020 fun. I remember TA's walk off over the Yankees in the Field of Dreams game. Oh, yeah. Man, the whole country was like, boy, that White Sox team, man, they got a lot of personality. Didn't see that last year. Do you want your team to show that swagger, that fun, that enthusiasm this year? Absolutely. I mean, look, that was missing. That was absolutely missing last year. And it was part of our identity. And in the end, players or anyone in any professional environment thrives when they're able to be themselves, to be comfortable, to show the world who they are and that they're taking pride in in their accomplishments. So we want that environment. We want TA to do what TA does. We want guys to be able to show some of their personality and some of their identity because that's likely a byproduct, not only of them feeling comfortable and being able to excel, but when you have a whole unit doing that together, that means good times are happening. So absolutely want to see that. I agree with you completely. We, we lost some of that in 22, um, but I feel like it's coming back. Rick, uh, from your seat, how difficult was it for you to navigate through the distraction for Mike Clevenger? I know that's not what you wanted, but that's what happened. I, I guess from everything we read, it's behind the situations behind him. But in the moment, what was that like for you? You know, it, it was... Uh, a unique situation, one that we fortunately hadn't had to dealt, deal with as an organization for the last couple of decades that I've been around here. Uh, but it was also one that I think maybe reinforced uh, in the clubhouse the idea of trying to remain focused on your individual tasks that's ahead of you for that day. Uh, the players did an excellent job remaining focused on what we were trying to do here as a unit. I know that there was perhaps a lot of lot more discussion or distraction uh, outside the clubhouse or, or away from the team, but the team as a group, uh, I feel, remained focused on the task at hand, and then that continues to be the case going forward. By the way, Sunday night is the Oscars. Like, I haven't heard of 96% of the movies that are getting nominations. <laughs> are you a movie guy, and did you see the ones up for best picture? Oh man, I didn't know Sunday was the Oscars. I'm not gonna lie to you. Cap. I didn't know. So I, 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 oh boy. I feel like uh, I feel like I'm a movie guy, but since I don't know when the Oscars are, and I couldn't name like four movies or three movies that are nominated for Best Picture, I, I just got to tap out of that one. How about right? Top Gun Maverick? I saw that. You got to see that. That was I mean, awesome. Shoot, you know, you know my age. That that speaks to my youth. I yes. got to see Top Gun Maverick, and that was entertaining. I don't know if that's Best Picture worthy. Um, it's nominated. It's uh, up for it. Is it really? Yes. 
Well, there you go. I so uh, of the uh, pictures I'm aware of being nominated for Best Picture, I go with Top Gun Maverick. Good. I'm with you. Well, that's a hell of an answer. I, 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 we, we, we really thought I was going to ask you about your days at the drive-in watching E.T., but apparently you have seen something more modern since then, Rick. A little more modern. I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever been to a drive-in. I would have liked to, but, yeah, that's a little before my time. How old do you think I am, Jay Hood? Uh, in, that job, in, in that job, 75. Well, good point. Good point. I've been dramatically in the last 10 years. There's no doubt about that. Hey, man, if I could have, if I could have listened to some of the calls you've gotten over the years, whether it's, we're doing what? I got to do what? Yeah. That would be pretty funny yeah. stuff. <laughs> well, it'll age you. But, uh, you know, one nice thing about spring is it is a bit of rebirth. You know, not only the leaves on the trees and the grass turning green, but the return of, uh, the return of baseball, I think, gives us all sort of that shot in the arm and that rebirth and, and excitement for the for the summer ahead and that's what we're feeling out here all right let's go rick i would be remiss if i didn't ask you lastly uh just the the pace of the game cap and i talked about this earlier regarding the spring training numbers we saw this from jeff pass in the time of the game 301 in 2022 now down to 236 i, I didn't know the game was broken but apparently these machinations will help the game so what's the difference that you see from last year to this year you know it, it's funny because i'm a bit of a traditionalist and, and in terms of the game at least and being sort of uh, you know obsessed with it my entire life I personally didn't really see anything wrong with it either but I also knew that I'm not the you know target for necessarily these changes it's in order to make the game more broadly appealing uh, and I gotta say the the pace of game watching it the last year in the minors and now seeing it for the first few weeks here in spring it's been a big positive. And I think one of the key key elements of it is the changes didn't remove any game action. They removed the non-game action. So it's hard to object to losing 25 minutes of, you know, guys stepping out of the box or adjusting their batting gloves or throws over the first. So it's been, uh, it's been fun to watch. I, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens when there's the first, uh, walk-off pitch clock violation in a regular season game and how people react to that. But, so far, it's been uh, it's been really entertaining. Rick, we appreciate the time, man. Always love chatting with you. We'll see you around the ballpark in three weeks. I look forward to it, guys. Thanks for having me.